beginning in verse 6. The Bible says that there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, how grateful we are that you ordained that your spirit would move upon men to write holy words inscripted upon parchment to be passed from generation to generation as the revelation, as the true word of the living God. Lord, we thank you that these words are living and enduring. They are eternal. That everything in our lives will pass away, but the word that I read will never pass away. So, Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that these words would accomplish the very purpose for which you sent them in the life of everyone here. And, Lord, I pray that you would bless your servant, bless those that he serves today, Grant me a mouth to speak. Lord, grant they ears to hear. We trust that the Holy Spirit will do this because we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. In my lifetime, there have been many legendary men with the name John. It's been around 57 years. So I can remember a few. There was a great president called John Fitzgerald Kennedy when I was a boy. A great NFL quarterback who played for the Baltimore Colts called John Unitas. How many of you remember Johnny U? There was a great actor. His nickname was the Duke, but his real name was John Wayne. And I confess to you as a boy, there was a legendary musician that I was really fond of, and his name was John Lennon. Well, when I was seven, there was a song that was written about, this, about a legendary guy named John who was six feet six inches tall. And the song became so legendary that it was one of those rare songs that it made, it rose to number one on the country, the pop, and the easy listening charts which is really a, a very rare, rare feat. But for those of you that don't know this song, I'm going to sing it for you this morning. Okay? And uh, you'll find out who this fella is. I have to step to this screen for a moment in order to sing it with you. But I'd like to sing this legendary song about a man named John. If you would begin the song, please. And I think we'll recover from this. Here it is. Okay, you guys ready? Hallelujah. Here goes. <clears throat> Big John. Big John. Ooh. Every morning at the mine, you can see him arrive. He stood 6'6 and weighed 245. Kind of broad at the shoulder and narrow at the hip. And everybody knew he didn't give no lip to Big John. Big John. Big John. Big bad John. John. Nobody seemed to know where John called home. He just drifted into town and they all alone. Didn't say much, kind of quiet and shy, but if you spoke at all, you just said hi to Big John. Somebody said he came from New Orleans where he got in a fight over a Cajun queen and a crashing blow from a huge right hand sent a Louisiana fella to the promised land, Big John. Big John. Come on, everybody help me out this now. Big John. Big bad John. Ooh. Big John. Ooh. Then came the day at the bottom of the mine when the timber cracked and men started crying. Miners were praying and hearts beat fast. Everybody thought that they breathed their last, except John. 
through the dust and the smoke of this man-made hell walked the giant of a man that the new miners knew well grabbed a sab and tigger gave it with a groan and like a giant oak tree he just stood there alone big john, big john. you can sing along come on big sing with me john. all the guys Big bad John. Okay, very good. Big John. Oh, now the song increases. With all his strength, he gave a mighty shove. Then a miter yelled out, there's a light up above. And 20 men scrambled from a would-be grave. Now there's only one left down there to save. Big John. Come on, clap your hands with me. When Jackson Timbers, they started back down, they came that rubble way down in the ground and the smoke and the gas melts out of that mine. Everybody knew it was the end of the line for Big John. Everybody. Big John. Come on, help me out now. Big okay, John. guys. Big. Ooh. Yeah, that's good. Big John. Now they never reopened that worthless pit. They just placed a marble stand in front of it. These few words are written on that stand. At the bottom of this line, mine lies a big, big man. Big John. Everybody. Big John. Big John. Very good. Big John. Give yourself a hand. Amen. Big John, Big John. Praise the Lord. I know what you're thinking. What in the world was that all about? Right? Well, this is what it's about. As we continue our series under the guise of the greatest story ever told, the story of the life and times of Jesus Christ, there's a man who jumps to the forefront of our series. A man that was big, bigger than life in many ways. And he was bad. Not, not morally bad or evil or corrupt, but he was, as your dictionary says, he was bad in an admirable kind of way. He was bad in the sense that he was good, he was great. That's kind of a slang term that we use today. When something's good, we call it bad, right? And that's why today, the next message in this series of messages on Jesus Christ is this title, A Man Named John. There was a man who came from God. His name was John. He's a mountain of a man. According to Revelation, Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, there was no one greater than he, born of woman, no one greater than John. He's a man who kind of bridges the gap between the Old and the New Testament. He's the last person mentioned, he's the last thing person message me mentioned in the Old Testament, in Malachi 4. In, in Luke's, in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark's gospel, which was the first gospel written, he's the first person mentioned after the introductory uh, salutation. And so we're gonna study that a little bit, uh, this man named John. And here's why. Here's why this is important. I pray that you'll, you'll tune in because a study of this big bad man named John, and you know I'm speaking of not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist, it's going to help us to really understand what the gist, the, the core, the guts of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Because I'm afraid we live in a day where we really don't understand the gospel. We really don't understand it. But John shows up on the scene of redemptive history and explains it for us. And so that's why it's important for us to, to hear these words this morning and to respond, okay? On a more serious note, amen. You sing very well too, by the way. I'm proud of you all. Give yourselves a hand for that. You really did good, amen. So I want to begin. This is not a textual sermon. It has to be more topical because so much is said about John. You have to jump around if, it, if you please. But it's important for us to do this. And uh, we're going to begin by looking at the man named John. And by that I mean we're going to look at the construct and the character of the man. Well, we saw some, week back, some weeks back that he was miraculously conceived. He was a man who was uh, a miracle baby. We saw that an angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appeared to the priest Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, who was 
elderly with his wife, Elizabeth. They were barren. Um, they were well along in years. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and, and said to him, uh, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You are to give him the name John, which means God is gracious. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many people of Israel will he turn back to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make a people ready for the Lord. So he was a miraculous baby. He was, a, he was the only baby Scripture speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit. He was, interestingly enough, the second cousin of Jesus. How do you know that? Well, Gabriel tells us that in Luke chapter 1, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary to announce to her she would be the son of the Messiah, he says to her, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month which with her, who was called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So we know that he was Jesus' second cousin. He was six months older than him. And uh, Constance Richards once said, Constance, uh, cousins are friends that will love you forever. And someone said, a cousin is a ready-made friend for life. Hallelujah. What's also notable about John is he was a man of conviction and courage. Great conviction and courage. In Matthew chapter 14, for example, Scripture tells us that Herod had arrested John and imprisoned him as a favor to his wife Herodias, who was the former wife of Herod's brother Philip. Why? Because John had been telling Herod, it's, it's against God's law for you to marry her. And Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed that John was a prophet. So he was a man of great courage. Luke tells us that he rebuked Herod, which was uh, somewhat of a suicide mission for a prophet in those days. He chided, he reproved, reproved sharply Herod, not only because of that marriage, but because of all the other things that were evil that he had done. So this was a gutsy guy. Amen? And that's why Jesus said of him in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7, uh, to the crowds that were coming out to see him, what did you expect to see? Some reed swayed by the wind? Some, some man of some wilty character? Some man who has no solid convictions? Is that what you expect to see? That's not who John is. But you know, he was also, before I make his legacy too big, he was a man who could crack. He was human. He could question things. Because once he was imprisoned by Herod, Matthew 11, verse 3 tells us that he sent some of his disciples to Jesus, his cousin, to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Wow. What was that all about? Adam Clark says it this way, John now began through the length of his confinement to entertain doubts about Jesus, which perplexed and harassed his mind. Yeah, he was a guy who could doubt. It just seemed good to me today to just introduce another great American whose name is John in my mind. He's kind of a big bad guy in my mind. Because he was a, as we were commemorating great Americans today, we took a moment to do that. Praise the Lord, it's an important thing to do. But there was a, a man who was a naval fighter pilot during the Vietnam War. And... Um, his plane was shot down over Hanoi. And uh, as his plane was plummeting, he ejected himself from the plane. And the ejection was so violent, when he hit the ground, he broke his left arm in three places, his right arm in one place, his leg in another place, and he knocked himself unconscious, only to be awakened, strangely enough, by the gun butt of Vietnamese soldiers, the ends of their bayonets, they stabbed his abdomen. They stabbed his, his, uh, his legs. And they took him to a prison called the, uh, that came to be known as the Hanoi Hilton, 
where they put him in solitary confinement and programmatically beat him severely. For So he was in prison for two years, six years, for about two. They beat him so severely that they rebroke his right leg, they broke his hips, they broke many of his teeth at the gum line, and um, broke his left arm again, too, because they were trying to get information out of this naval officer, but all he would give them was his name, rank, serial number, and birthday. At one point, the Vietnamese, because they were trying to promote this propaganda about being a merciful nation, were planning this uh, propaganda campaign to release some officers from the prison just to try to put on this guise to the world that they were, they were merciful captors. And they went to this naval officer and said, we're going to let you out. And he said, I'm not going to leave unless you release with me every prisoner in this prison with me, which they refused. And so they were incensed at his refusal to leave. And they began to beat him more severely hanging him by a, with a rope on a hook. He would hang until they knocked him unconscious, rebroke his bones again. And uh, this big bad man named John said at his acceptance speech at the 2008 Republican National Convention, he said this, his name is John McCain, I, after I turned down their offer, they worked me over harder than ever before, and for a long time they did it. And then they broke me. They broke me. When they brought me back to my cell, I was hurt and ashamed, and I didn't know how I could face my fellow prisoners. The good man in the cell next door to me, Bob Craner, saved me. Through the taps on a wall, he told me I, had, I fought as hard as I could. No man can stand alone, always. And he told me to get back up and fight again for our country. For the men I had the honor to serve with because every day they fought for me. And I fell in love with my country. When I was a prisoner in somebody else's, I loved it, not just for the many comforts of life here, I loved it for its decency, for its faith and its wisdom, justice and goodness of its people. I loved it because it was not just a place, but an idea, a cause worth fighting for. I was never the same again. I wasn't my own man anymore. I wasn't my country. And this is the guy I'm talking about right here who really, kind of a big bad John in my mind, and really deserves um, our respect. But anyway, the John that we read in our scripture text was not as fortunate as this John, because the John in our scripture text, he didn't get out of prison alive. This one did. See, John the Baptist was killed in prison. Here's how it happened. Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she, was, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went and asked her mother, what shall I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And at once, the girl hurried to the king with a request, I want you to give me right now on the head, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison. And um, I think the reason he was beheaded was because, point two, his mission, the mission of John. Let's take a look at that. He had a tough mission, kind of like John McCain had a tough mission. How would you like to be in an airplane with people shooting at you? <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid of heights. No thanks. You know? Tough enough to get up in an airplane without somebody shooting rockets at it. Amen? It takes courage to do that. But John had a tough mission. 
And as I said, he was the man who was going to bridge the gap between the old and the new. Here's how the Old Testament ends. See, I send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, Mark, the first gospel written, begins his gospel with this introduction. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written, verse 2 in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, verse 4 says. John arrived on a scene. And what was his mission? His mission was to prepare the way for the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, this is not a concept that was foreign to the minds of the people in that day. For example, Adam Clark writes in his commentary, it was customary for the Hindu kings went on journeys to send certain classes of people two or three days before them to command the inhabitants to clear the way, a very necessary precaution where there were no public roads. So in that day, for example, whenever there was a king coming to an area, there was no public roads. They would send envoys of people to clear out the, the paths and to clear out the rocks and to prepare the way for this large entourage to come Luke puts this little light on it also, that he would come to fill in every valley. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked road shall become straight, and the rough way smooth. Or as Martin Vincent writes, this is an allusion to the practice of the eastern monarchs. On occasions of their progress, heralds were sent out to call on the people to clear and improve the old roads or to make new ones. All the inhabitants were to assemble along the proposed route and prepare the way before him by gathering out stones, straightening out the crooked places, and making the rough places level and smooth. And this is what John was to do. But he wasn't going to do this with a pick and a shovel. He's going to do it with his mouth. And just a little side note, that's why Jesus said, this man is more than a prophet. This is big bad John. <laughs> He's more than a prophet. Why is that? Because the prophets of old foresaw Messiah's coming, but John actually saw the Messiah come. Saw him with his own eyes. That's what made him greater than any other prophet and the greatest man who ever lived. And here are the words he would use to prepare the way of the Lord. Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is just over the horizon. He's on his way. We'll see him next week. Don't miss it. He shows up. Next. Finally, Jesus arrives, week 12. I can't wait to see him. But John says, he's just coming over the hill. So you better prepare the way through repentance. Now, let's look at the moment of John. What I mean by that, the, the, the time of John, the period in which he arose, this is also what made his mission very difficult, the time that he came. It's interesting to me that Matthew 3, 1 says, in those days, you know, what days? Luke elaborates on those days. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetriarch of Ituria and Triconius and Lysanias, tetriarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. What Luke wanted you to know was this, that this was a very dark time in Israel's history. It was a dark time politically. See, he mentions five Gentile kings ruling over Israel at that time. That's why Luke wrote that down. He wanted the reader to know this was a very dark political time for the people of Israel. Another big bag, John, John MacArthur wrote this in his commentary about it. These men were petty monarchs who did whatever they wanted to do to exact upon the people whatever they wanted to exact. They had this sort of unsalable power and were basically wicked, evil, adulterous people under the sovereign power of the immensely dominant Caesar Tiberius, the successor to Caesar Augustus, who came into rule in the year 11 AD. 
These guys did whatever they wanted to do. They tyrannically ruled the people of Israel and Judah. And so Luke is saying this was a very dark time politically when John came to the forefront. But this was a dark time spiritually also. That's why he mentions Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. There was an apostate priesthood in place in Israel at that time. For example, Matthew chapter 26 reminds us that Caiaphas was the brainchild to the murder of Jesus. He was the one who created the sly plot to put Jesus to death. Why did he create a sly plot to put Jesus to death? Because of the apostasy of the high priesthood. John chapter 18 tells us that when they, they ultimately were going to arrest Jesus, it says that they brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the two men mentioned in Luke's account, the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good for one man to die for the people. Don't let them kid you, folks. He was not doing this because of national sympathy. He was doing this out of self-interest, a very selfish self-interest. John chapter 11 tells us that they were worried about the Romans, verse 48, taking away our place in our nation. And those high priests were talking about the positions they held and enjoyed. They were positions where uh, they were, according to Luke, for example, Luke 20, 46, where they were always dressed in flowing robes, and they were always greeted in the marketplaces, and they had the most important seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at all the banquets. In other words, what they did eventually, according to Mark chapter 11, is they made the house of God a den of thieves. It was a dark spiritual time. Well, how did they do that? Well, you notice how here it says that Jesus came in and he flipped over the table of the money changers? <laughs> you know what, the, what that's about? When the Jews would come to Jerusalem and to the temple to worship and, and they wanted to pay the temple tax, the high priest and the priesthood would say, oh, wait a minute, what, what, what coinage do you have? Well, I have a Roman coin, obviously. That's the currency of, of the Roman Empire. And whose inscription's on it? Caesar. Oh, we can't take that. See, we created these Jewish coins that you're going to have to purchase from us at, at a great usury, at, at a great interest. So they would take, you know, say, a, we'll put it in uh, uh, terms that we understand. They would take maybe a, a, a dollar coin from the, Rome, from, the, uh, from the Jewish pilgrim. and Oh, you have to give me, I need two dollars of your money to, to give you a one dollar Jewish coin. And they were just, they were, it was extortion is all it was. And if they would come with, say, a sheep, a lamb to sacrifice during the Passover, they would look at that lamb and say, hey, wait a minute, it's supposed to be a lamb without a blemish. Well, th this is the best one I have. Well, look at this. See the little blemish here? It's no good. They take that. You have to buy one of ours. Charge the, the, the worshiper some exorbitant price. Take that lamb, put it in the back, and another guy would come and say, hey, wait a minute, I got a lamb for you right here. You can't, well, we can't accept that lamb. And it got to the point where the pilgrims wouldn't even bother bringing lambs to the temple because none would be accepted because these guys were thieves. They were thieves. It was a racket. You talk about the Jewish mafia. Hallelujah, I'm telling you folks. It was bad. And so that's why you can understand the, the, the manner of John. Uh, he had a demeanor about him that was different. Let's talk about his, his, his dress. Matthew 1.4 says that he wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. Now, you know, I know that some people are thinking, hey, you ever see a camel hair coat? Kind of a nice, nice coat. You ever camel hair blazer? Kind of a nice blazer. But no, folks, it looked... Uh, it looked more like, more, more like this, you see. <laughs> As again, Albert Barnes ins explains, this is not the fine hair of the camel from which our elegant cloth is made called camlet, but this is the long shaggy hair of the camel from which a coarse, cheap cloth is made, still worn by the poorer classes in the East and by monks. Kind of looks like this again. The clothes that John wore, as John Gill writes, was usually for the penitents, for the men of austere lives and of the first class of holiness and religion to live in deserts, to fare hard and wear coarse apparel. Where, where, was, where was this den? He, he lived in the desert, folks. He didn't have a house. John didn't have a home. 
He didn't have a place to live. The desert was his home. That's why it says on Luke 3, 2, that during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Why there? That's where he lived. <laughs> that was home. Interestingly enough, uh, there's another prophet who dressed like John. His name was Elijah the Tishbite. Second Kings tells us uh, that a man ran into John, uh, Elisha the Tishbite, and the king asked him, what was he wearing? Garment of hair with a leather belt. He wanted to be like Mike, you know, kind of thing, right? He, I want to be like Mike, right? I want to be like Elijah. Amen? <laughs> and his diet, oh, it was interesting, man. Listen to this. Locusts and wild honey, mmm. That gets your appetite stirred, doesn't it? Folks, he ate locust and wild honey. Lo Everybody say locust. You know what a locust is? Okay, look, Albert Barnes. These constituted the food of the common people. Among the Greeks, the vilest of people used to eat them. And the fact that John made his food of them is significant of his great poverty and humble life. He goes on to say, the Jews were allowed to eat them. That's the only insect they were allowed to eat, according to Leviticus 11.22. In case you didn't know what a locust is, they are flying insects. The green ones are about two inches long and about the thickness of a man's finger. And the common brown locust is about three inches long. And uh, some species of the locust are eaten un until this day in eastern countries and are even esteemed as a delicacy when properly cooked. Remind me never to go to the Orient, amen, or to anywhere in the east. After tearing off the legs and the wings and taking out the entrails, they stick them in long rows over uh, wooden pits, spits, roast them at the fire, and then proceed to devour them with great zest. <laughs> Gets worse, folks. Hang on. There's also other ways to prepare locusts. For example, they cook them, dress them in oil, or having dried them, they pulverize them, and when other food is scarce, they make bread of the meal. Oh, man, I can't hardly wait to get a, a loaf of locust bread. Amen? Locust bread. <laughs> I don't think we're going to do lunch after church today, Lou. I think, I think that's... And look at this, folks. Look at this. Some people would actually pack them with salt in close masses, which they carry in their leather sacks, and from these they cut slices as they may need. How about, how about this? A locust sandwich on locust bread. Oh, man. But that's a, this is what John ate. I'm getting kind of sick. Ain't you get a little sick? Yeah. Now, no, folks, you know, you know, I am going somewhere with this. I really am. Everybody kind of try to get your uh, composure back and let your stomach settle for a moment. <laughs> You know, we need more Americans. America would be a better place if we had more Martin Luther Kings and John McCain. Church would be a better place if we had more John the Baptists. See, he lived in the desert. He wore coarse clothes. He ate, he ate locusts. Look, at, folks, we have ministers today. Uh, Joyce Meyer, here's her compound she, has, she owns a compound with five houses. And if you can't see the prices, one house is 400000 another house is 795000 another house is 725000 and she's getting that money from God's people. Another house is 350000 another house is 200000 This is a minister's home. There's an outdoor pool right there, in case you can't see it. Here's a Criflo Dollar's house. Here's his jet. He's got more than one. No wonder the church is in the condition she's in. And it says in Luke chapter 3, 7, his demeanor was this. He said to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? That doesn't sound like anything this guy would say. You snakes. Albert Clark says it this way. Here's what he meant by that. As their fathers were, 
so were they, children of the wicked one. This is God's estimate of a sinner, whether he weighed in wealth or sore in fame. And John pointed his finger at the crowd. He said, you're nothing but snakes, and you're children of the devil. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Boy, that sounds different than the message we hear today. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Hmm. See, folks, uh, you know, the Bible says we're the salt of the earth, uh, not the sugar of it. Can I get an amen from anybody? Can I get another amen from somebody? We're the salt of the earth. And so the ministry of John uh, was an amazing ministry. Mark 1, 4 says, He came baptizing, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Luke 3, 3, He went into the country, all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 3, 1, In those days John the Baptist came. It actually translates more accurately, John the Baptizer. He came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. And people went out to him from Ju Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. What was his ministry to call people to repent? That was his ministry. And when they didn't uh, repent so easily, he confronted people to repent. <laughs> yeah. Because see, Matthew's account records that the Sadducees and Pharisees wanted to see what all the hubbub was. All these people, and, and, and friends, you have to, I'll explain this to you in a moment, uh, but all these people were going to the river, and this crazy guy with a locust sandwich in his uh, pouch uh, with camel hair suit was just preaching this message of repentance, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and all these people would be baptized in the River Jordan. And they went out to see what was going on, and he turned to them and said, you brood of vipers. You snakes, what brings you out here? Who told you to flee from the coming wrath? So his ministry was to preach and to perform baptisms. Now, this is not a Christian baptism that he performed. Did you know baptism did not originate with the church? It, it existed long before the days of Jesus. See, there was... Now, if you were a Jew, you would have ceremonial washings if you, if you did something that made you unclean. You see that in Leviticus. If someone picks up a carcass, they must wash his, their clothes. They'll be unclean until evening. If, someone, if a man with a discharge spits on someone who is clean, that person must wash his clothes and bathe with water. He must take a bath. But baptism was performed on Gentile proselytes. In other words, if a Gentile wanted to become a, a, a participant of Judaism, if he wanted to worship in the temple, he had to be baptized, not a ceremonial washing, he, they would completely submerge him in water. It, and it was a testament of him saying, I realize I am an unclean Gentile. I am a Gentile dog. I, I, am, un, I, am, I am dirty. I am unworthy of, of entering into a clean religion like Judaism. So as, as a way of entering into, first of all, I will undergo the circumcision rite. I'll be circumcised. Every male will be circumcised. And then I'll be submerged in water to come out and come out and say, yes, I'm a dirty, rotten, Gentile sinner. Therefore, I'll be baptized in water. And what John was trying to do was say to the Jew, you need to be baptized too. You're just as dirty as a Gentile. You're just as sinful. That's what he was trying to say. See, what Jews would say is, hey, I'm saved because Abraham is my father. And he said, no, you're not. You think your Judaism saves you? You think being a descendant of Abraham is, is, is going to save you? He said, that's not going to save you. God can raise up children out of these stones. And so, brothers and sisters, what John emphasized and what Jesus emphasized is what I want to emphasize with you today as I get near the end of this message. He said, real faith does something. He's basically saying this. Here's what he's saying. Repentance produces a certain fruit. Are you with me? He is saying this, folks. I'm challenging, you, I'm challenging you to produce the fruit of repentance. 
What do you mean by that? See, if you've really repented, your life will look different. What do you mean by that, John? Here's what he said in Luke 3. Uh, what's the proof? The man with two tunics will share with him who has none. The one who has food will do the same. In other words, somebody who's really repented stops living selfishly and shares with those in need. Right? Then he says to the tax collectors, teacher, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he said. The soldier said, what should we do? Don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Or in other words, one stops extorting things from others. To put it in a relevant context to us today, the haves share with the have-nots, and the have-nots don't extort things from the haves. That's worth repeating. The haves share with the have-nots, but the have-nots do not try to extort more from the haves. They're content with what they get. That's repentance. Okay? Okay? Is everybody awake? In other words, my practical behavior supports my professed belief. And this is an important concept to grasp because Luke 3 9 records that he said this, John said this, the axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What he's saying is this, if you don't repent, you'll burn in hell. That's what he's saying, folks. And now, folks, some old-time commentators who I love to use because they, they lived in a different era than we did said this about this verse. Adam Clark, there's not a moment to spare. This is what he says, the essence of what John was trying to say. God is about to cut off every impenitent soul. You must therefore either turn to God immediately or be utterly and finally ruined. John Wesley, there is no room for idle pretenses. Speedy execution is determined against all that do not repent. In other words, John is saying the axe is already at the root of the tree. God is about ready to strike you down with judgment. He didn't come off just to lop off a branch or two. He came to strike you down, to, to totally take you out if you don't repent. That's what he's saying. Now, folks, what is repentance? What is it? Well, there's a, it's kind of a threefold action, and I need to just hammer this home with you today as I close. What is it? Most of us don't understand what it is. And, and I'm just going to spell this out for you just as simply as I know how, because unless you repent, you too will perish. I know that's not Joel Olstein-ish, but, you know, I've got to tell you the truth, folks. What is it? Number one, it's an intellectual acknowledgement of what? Of my sin. It starts here. David said it this way. It's to change, one, change one's mind. That's the literal definition of the word. To change one's mind. David said it this way. I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Everybody read this with me. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Now, folks, today we have a modern, some modern synonyms for sin, and it's this. A mistake, an alternative lifestyle, a disease, an addiction, a character defect. No, it's sin. That's why some people never get free. Because they're calling their sin something else. It's sin. It's sin. You're defiling your body. And if any man, Scripture says, if any man destroys the temple of God, and we are the temple of the living God, God will destroy him. 1 Corinthians 3. It's sin. How, Pastor Tom, how did you get freed 24 years ago? I called it what it was. My addiction is a sin. I am, I am sinning against the holy God. I'm, I'm defiling my temple, and I'm, and I'm destroying my life, and it's just not about me. It's about what I'm doing to him. That, 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 friends, that's what it's about. 
And then it becomes you intellectually acknowledge it, and then there's a re an emotional reaction. See, David said, he begins that psalm by saying, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Now, folks, you have to realize when he, re when he said this, it was he had just taken another man's wife in adultery and planned that, that man's murder. He, you would think the issue was all horizontal, but he realized that it was vertical. What he did was a sin against God. That's why he cried out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. There's a deep emotional response that I see there, don't you? For he says in Psalm 32, when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Friends, when, when, when you really understand what sin is, there is a, there's a grief you feel. There's a groaning you feel. You realize, friends, that this is not a minor issue, but you're sinning against a, mag a magnificent, majestic God. And there's an emotional reaction. But friends, please understand this. Repentance is not remorse. It's not regret. What do you mean? Let me just illustrate it for you. In Exodus 9, God's sending the plagues to Egypt. He's sending hail and he's sending rain. And he says, stretch out your hand to Moses toward the sky. So that hail will fall over Egypt on the men and the animals and everything that grows. And Moses did it. And it beat down everything, killed the animals in the field, stripped them bare. And Pharaoh summoned Moses and he said, I sinned. I sinned. The Lord is in the right and I am in the wrong. Pray to the Lord for me, for we have had enough thunder and hail. And I will let you go. So you know what happens. Moses prays. But what happens after everything stops? He and his officials harden their hearts again. See, friends, repentance is not, I, I really feel bad about the consequences of my sin. I really feel bad about what it's producing in my life. That's not repentance. That's remorse. And that will not save you. That won't save you. Oh, we're we having a good time today, folks. Okay. See, you can feel bad about, sin, about your sin and go straight to the pit of hell, folks. Because there's one more step you have to take. It's intellectual, it's emotional, and it's volitional. It acts. Repentance has action attached to it. What does it look like? I can't think of a better example of it than Luke 15. You remember the story of the prodigal son? squanders everything he has on riotous living, wild living. You know, he gets in a plane and goes to Vegas and loses it all, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, walks the streets, lies with a few women, gets drunk, loses it at the gambling table, and I mean, he's busted. And he comes to his senses. And here's what he says. See, it's a volitional response. It acts. It makes the decision to go in a different direction. See that? He, and he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, I am starving to death. And he says, look at this. I will. See, it's volitional. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. I won't stay in this mire. I won't stay in this muck. I will sit out. And I will go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you, folks. Real repentance moves. It moves. And what direction does it move? It moves towards God. And so he got up, and he went where? To his father. And in this parable, the father is symbolic of God himself. Real repentance moves towards God. It doesn't just assess the damage of my irresponsibility and say, oh, woe is me. I'm busted now. Oh, I made a mess of my family. 
Oh, I made a mess of this business. I extorted all these things, and now this business is never going to survive, and I'll be put in jail, and I'll be put on trial because I took all the money, and I, and I used it for my selfish purposes. That's not repentance. Oh, I'm so sorry I'm going to go to jail over this. Repentance is this. Oh, I have sinned against the holy God. God, I have offended thee, Lord. Oh, Lord, I, I'm sorry that I did such a wicked thing. And it moves towards God. It moves towards God. The direction of repentance is Godward. Wash your hands, you sinners. Come near to God. He'll come near to you. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. Grieve. See, there's the, the first verse has the action. Second verse has the emotional response. Third verse has the intellectual. Just humble yourself before the Lord. God, I'm nothing. And He will lift you up. Come on, somebody praise God with me this morning. Amen. See, friends, if it's just, I just feel sorry. That's not godly sorrow. It's selfish sorrow. Godly sorrow, godly sorrow, godly sorrow leads to repentance and leaves no regrets. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Worldly sorrow brings death. You can be sorry as the day is long, but that doesn't mean you're, you're going to be saved. Because your sorrow has to be directed Godward. Okay? Now, finally, this is it, the message of John. Now, this is what's beautiful about this, folks. This is what makes the message of Jesus Christ good news. You can't be saved without repenting. But in order to be saved, you have to add to that repenting, believing. Believing. Matthew 21, 32, For John came to show you the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not, here's the order, repent and believe. You see that? Repent and believe. Jesus himself said when he shows up on the scene, we'll see this next week. This is the words of Jesus himself. Repent and believe. The good news for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so Mark tells us that after he baptized people, after he he had told them to have a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which is not a Christian baptism. Again, when, when we do a Christian baptism, we are, we're not confessing our sins, we're confessing Christ. It's a whole different dynamic. But in John's day, it was an acknowledgement that, yes, I am a dirty, rotten sinner. Whether I'm a Jew, whether I'm a Gentile, whether I'm a religious leader, or whether I'm just a common man, I am a sinner. I am a sinner in need of salvation. John was trying to get everyone to acknowledge that. And, he, and once people were being baptized and coming out of the River Jordan, John Mark writes, and this was his message. Okay, you've been baptized. Now, after me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! The Holy Spirit! Oh, that's good news, folks. <laughs> that's good news. I baptize you with a baptism of repentance. He will baptize you with a baptism of regeneration. In other words, he will make your dead spirit come alive because when you put faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit will come inside of your dead spirit and take up residence in you. And his baptism is a regeneration baptism. Oh, praise God, folks. That's good whether you know it or not. Luke 3. The people were waiting expectantly and wondering in their hearts if John might be the Christ. John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I comes. The thongs of whose sandals are not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Woo! Fire, baby. Fire! In other words, friends, you won't be, you know, just as passionate as you were about your sin, you'll be as passionate about the things of God. <laughs> I'm passionate. Do you pick up on that? Well, friend, I was a passionate sinner. 
Oh, friend, I, I was leading the pack. Trust me on that one. Well, when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and what happens is when you get baptized, into the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes you and places you into the body of Christ. And friends, we Pentecostal believe that there's another baptism recorded in Acts chapter 2 where they are all together in one place where Jesus told them in Acts 1, John baptized you with water, but in a few days I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. They were all in that upper room, and all of a sudden they were cloven tongues of fire came set upon each one of them, and they all spake with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And friends, I've had that experience too. Hallelujah. And friends, that's why this guy's on fire. I'm on fire. Friend, I could, uh, you know, I slept three hours last night. I, I, I could go a week without eating, but you put me up here, buddy, the light goes, something, something from heaven comes on me, friend, because this guy's filled with fire. Fire. And uh, because I repented. I repented. Oh, folks, look, you, you talk about a guy under conviction. I remember. I, I would go, man, <laughs> with my black leather coat, you know, marijuana bag in my pocket. I'd go, to, I'd go to Catholic confessional every Saturday. I, I felt so rotten. I, I did this and I did that and I did the other and I did the other and I did the other and I did the other. And they, you know, well, go do this. But nobody pointed me to Jesus. It took a drunk getting, uh, thank God no preacher got in the way. <laughs> it took a drunk getting saved in a city mission in Los Angeles, California, calling me from there and said, I found the solution. I found the key. I found life. Tell me what it is. You need Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Tom, I found it. What is it, Tim? Tell me. You need Jesus. Oh, tell me more. You've got to put your faith in him. I says, I, I think I already did it. He says, but no, wait a minute. You've got to repent. What do you mean, Tim? You've got to surrender the whole of your life. What? Surrender my life. For I was used to going in Sunday morning, punching in and punching out. I couldn't even keep my mind on what was going on because all I could think about was I'm going to put 100 on the Steelers at one and I'm going to try to double up at four. I, I gamble all my money away. I can only think about who I was going to pick. And, you know, and, and, you know, that's why Vegas is it's paid with gold. You always lose. The house always wins. Amen. You don't win nothing, man. Surrender my life. Yeah, Tom, you, you're living a selfish life. You've got to turn around. You got to come to the altar of God and surrender your life. I, I had a I had a guy in a city mission tell me that, and I said, I don't know if I can do that. And this newly saved man says, I'm going to pray for you two thousand miles away. That you'll do this. That God will help you to do that. Friend, don't you know that 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 brand new Christian praying for me brought such conviction on my life. I was so miserable. I actually got on, a, on 680 and got my car up to a speed where I was thinking about taking it off into a pole. I, I, I was like, I, and, then every, and then those words rang out. Jesus. And, <laughs> Jesus. And, 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 and I got, you know, you know you're desperate, you're looking for God. When you get out of the newspaper looking for God, I got out of the newspaper and said, man, I, 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 I the Saturday night thing said there's church services and I, man, I, I know I know where I'm going now. There ain't God ain't there. He ain't nowhere near the place. He ain't nowhere near the place. How do you know? Because the religious leader said to me, I said, man, I can't deal with my life. He said, the sun is going to shine tomorrow. Hit me with a cliche. <laughs> yeah, I know it's going to shine tomorrow. I, you know, I hope it don't. I hope I don't wake up to see it. I'm miserable. Somebody help me. So I opened up a newspaper ad and it said, all it said was this, if you regretted the first half of your life, give the second half to Jesus Christ. Just give him your life. Listen, it didn't say give him your sin, give him your problems, give him your poverty. It said give him your life. Surrender your life. That's what it said. And guess what happened? That's what I did. And that was 24 years ago and I'm still doing it day by day. 
I still surrender my life to him. That's the last time a drink ever passed those lips. That's the last time a joint ever hit these, this much. That was the last time. Because I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, come on, folks. Jimmy, you need to get up here and help me out, okay? Now I lost my doohickey here. Okay, here it is. See? See, this is next week's scripture text. I'm going to let you peek at it. After he gets all these people to confess their sins and get baptized, he says, look who's coming over the horizon. Look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There he comes. Look. You mean he'll take away my sin too? Yes. Friend, don't you know I knew, I knew this much about Jesus? I, no Bible in my house. We were, we were pagans. But uh, Jesus, the one my friend Tim told me about, from his little, from the payphone of the city mission in Los Angeles, forgive me of all my sins. I can't live this way anymore. I can't live like this anymore. God, I hate my sin and I hate my life and I hate using it. I, God, I hate, I, hate, I hate this life. Lord, he said, if I asked you to come into my heart, you would. And at that moment, at that moment, folks, at that moment, I was baptized by, to the, by the Spirit into the body of Christ. God placed me in Christ and I became a new creation. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, friend, I tell you, it's good. And, and in my repentive state, he said, Tom, lift up your eyes and look. Look to Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see? And he'll take away your sin too. But friends, only the precursor to regeneration of the Holy Spirit is repentance. You have to call it what it is. It's a sin. You got to call it what it is, friend. You can't, sh you can't get saved shucking and jiving with God. You got to say, God, this is a sin. No idolater, no homosexual offender, no drunkard will enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You won't get in. God, I can't get in being a drunkard, a, a, a sexually immoral man, a lesbian, a homo. I, I ain't getting in. A thief, no thief, no liars will enter into the kingdom of heaven. God, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a fornicator. You've got to call it what it is, folks. You've got to say, I, I know my sin is always before me. God, I know it's there. And then you've got to say, God... Folks, I pray right now, Heavenly Father, I pray for the godly sorrow to come on this congregation right now. Lord, godly sorrow. See, what's the difference? Worldly sorrow caused Judas to hang himself. Godly sorrow has a radiation of hope in it. There's an essence of hope in it. Godly sorrow caused King Saul to fall on his sword. Worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings a man or woman to Jesus. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he'll say, arise and sin no more. Where, where are those that condemn you? There are none, Lord, neither do I condemn you. Go and lead your life of sin. That's what, that's what godly, godly sorrow does. It brings you to God. Let's stand together at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's stand. Praise the Lord. Oh, God is so good, folks. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Look, folks. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man abides in me, he'll bear much fruit. What did John say? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Well, guess what? You can't bear the fruit 
of, of virtue. It's got to be God in you bearing the fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit. See, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Uh, look at this, folks. Folks, look at this. Drunkenness, orgies, envy. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You, you can't live like this and inherit the kingdom of God. You can't be sexually immoral. You can't be an idolater. You can't be involved in witchcraft. You can't be a jealous, selfish, envious, drunk. You can't. You can't. You have to repent. You have to repent. You have to say, that, Lord, that's wrong. The fruit of the Spirit, look at this, is love for other people, love for God, joy. Do I look like a sad guy to you? I'm not sad. Peace. Patient. Faithfulness, friends. You know I've been here for 14 years. I preach to an empty, I, I preach to an empty sanctuary. I preach to, it don't matter if there's two people, 200 people. I will be faithful. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God's in me. I'm going to be faithful. You love me, you hate me. That, that doesn't affect my faithfulness. It's because it's, it's divine. I, I, I'm, I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm baptized in Christ. I'm in, I'm in Christ. He's in me. Oh, friend, that's what you need. You need Jesus in your life. But he won't cohabitate with your sin. You got to repent of it. You got to say, God, I'm done with this. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of this sin and break its power from me. Friends, as God is my witness, that day, that day I gave my life to Jesus, I was, you know, imagine alcoholic beverage at 11 in the morning. 6.30 that night, I said, Jesus, forgive me. That was August the 21st of 1988. That was the last time a drop of alcohol ever passed my lips. Whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Uh, he sets you free, friend. He sets you free. If you want to be free, some folks prefer this over Jesus. And I, that I'll never understand. Oh, 